Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Hamweavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I am the Advertising Manager, and I get to be your host today. We want to thank our sponsor, Ply Spinners Guild, for sponsoring our episode today. We appreciate them and, and all they do to make sure Textiles and Tea is on the air. Thank you so much, Ply Spinners Guild. Go check them out on their website. They do some great stuff. As always, if you'll do your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat, I can't hardly see them in chat. I've got to keep an eye on things, but um, we love your comments. Keep those coming, but I would appreciate if the questions were in the Q&A. Today, we have Marcelin Bennett Carpenter. Marcelin is an interdis interdisciplinary fiber artist and educator. She earned an MFA at the Fiber from Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2003. She served as the artist in resident at the Kingswood Weaving Studio from 2003 to 2023. So she's just left there and we're going to talk more about that today. She's taught at Haywood Mountain School of Craft in Maine, Penland School of Craft in North Carolina. She attended the open residency at Haystack and was a recent Good Heart Artist in Residence. She's also the co-founder of Namtinga Sando a BC studio, an active weaving cooperative in Africa. And she's going to talk some more about that also. She maintains an active practice through her studio in Michigan and exhibits throughout the North America. Recent works include a large scale installation in the Detroit Symphony Orchestra Fisher Music Center. And we are excited to have her here to start off 2024. Hey, Lynn. Hey. Welcome. <laughs> yes, Yay. there you are. Hello. Hi, Kathy. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year to you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're so excited to have you here today. So let's start off with the first question, which is what is your favorite tea? Oh my gosh, a true treat is having milk tea with honey, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> but it always depends on your mood, right? Right. So lots of teas to enjoy. <laughs> especially when it's cold out, like it is in Michigan a lot, right? Oh yeah, yeah. But well, hopefully the sun might come out. <laughs> oh, good. So how did you get started in fiber? So that's a good question. I sort of joke that fiber chose me. <laughs> I sort of stumbled into fiber. Um, I have a BFA in drawing and painting. And as I was doing a lot of drawing and painting, I also became very interested in large scale architectural installations um, that were very much inspired by material and the materiality. Um, so I took a workshop at Oxbow actually here in Michigan and was creating an installation up in the dunes. And one of the instructors there told me that Lynn, I think you're a fiber artist. <laughs> and so I was researching grad schools at the time and um, started to read the sort of philosophies of fiber and it all just synchronized in me. And I'm like, I'm a fiber artist. <laughs> so that's how it happened. And like you said, in the introduction, I went on to get a degree in fiber from the Cranbrook Academy of Art here in Michigan, so. But we'll have to talk more because I really see a, the drawing painting influence on your work. So I hope you'll talk more as that, of that as we go along. But you have a unique technique that to make your weavings is that you, you take this really soft wood and you do the drawing and the painting on it and then you cut it. And we have, um, here's some images of the once the piece is completely done, right? And then on the right, we have it being that you've cut it up. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. I, a lot of my time is spent creating the drawing and painting. Um, and then once that's done and it's on, then usually um, basswood is the, uh, the wood I use, but I've used cherry. I'm currently doing a piece on birch. Um, I've used balsa wood as well. Um, so that they're soft woods. Um, they're usually used in architectural models, actually. So that's sort of my source for my material. And then it's cut with just a, an X-Acto knife um, by hand, um, which is 
to me, the, the sort of the magic of the handwoven drawings is the fact that as I cut, I can undulate, subtly undulate um, the cut. So that almost mimics thread. Um, that's something hard to pick up in the, the photographs, but as you experience these handwoven drawings and walk across them, you'll notice that, that hand um, in the cutting itself. We have a video we're gonna show. And if you wanna tell us more as you watch this. Sure. Yeah, so here I am cutting. Um, yeah, so once it's all cut, so that's the first step of the weaving process, then I can weave them back together into the floor loom. And it looks like you don't really care how straight it is, that you actually make it kind of undulating the cuts? Yeah, exactly. Okay. That to me is the magic to see that you can see the undulations there um, that really communicates that these are made by hand um, and not by machine. Yeah. Now, what kind of loom is this? Uh, so I use Maycomber looms. <laughs> They're my favorite, um, favorite looms that I've taught on and weave on. So yeah, tried and true, um, nice and consistent, <laughs> good tension. Now, I know somebody's going to ask, so I'm going to just go ahead and ask now, what do you, you may have said this, I missed it. What is the, the paint or ink or dye that you use? Is it one of those? Yes. So I use um, all sorts of different drawing and painting material. Oh. The paint I use is acrylic, um, but I'll use pen um, and pencil, marker, paint pen. I've worked with silver point um, with the hand woven drawings as well, gold leaf. I'm just sort of always exploring drawing mediums. That's sort of what makes me excited and keeps me going is, you know, all the different material possibilities that I can apply to the surface of the wood. Yeah. It's <laughs> just a perfect combination of all your art, you know, you've got your drawings and the paintings and you, and you've combined it. It's wonderful. You didn't have to choose. You just combined them all together. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Now, I understand that Gerhard Nodell is a big influence on you, that you, he's an inspiration oh. for you. Is that where you got this, the idea to go this with this technique or? Well, my driving impulse um, with this work or the driving question I should say is how do I merge drawing and weaving? Um, so that's really what was my investigation. Um, and when I started teaching weaving um, back in 2003, that was really my curiosity. Um, how do I take these two different parts of myself and, and merge them together? Um, so, and Gerhardt is, uh, a person I spend a lot of time with. He's a dear friend, incredible mentor. And I'm also part of his textile collectors group. So not only do I get to look a lot at Gerhardt's work, um, but I also get to look a lot at his collections and discuss it with him. Um, and one of the things that Gerhardt and I discuss a lot and observe and get excited about in the textiles we're looking at together is the drawing. <laughs> He's always talking about, oh, look at the drawing that's happening. So whether we're looking at embroidery or tapestry or batik or, you know, whatever the, the technique or strategy that's being used in the textile, he's always looking for the drawing that's happening. Um, and within his own work, he too has um, worked with drawing. There's one of my favorite bodies of work that he's done um, are his large scale weavings. And what he did is he used um, cotton tape and he actually took photographic imagery and screen printed it on the, on the tape and then wove it together. And he did all sorts of other acrobatics within the weaving, double weaving, two warps. Um, so, um, so those weavings are extraordinary. Um, but the difference with mine is I'm 
using actual traditional drawing and painting materials. The material is hard, it's not soft. Um, so that it lends itself to other operations, um, like they can become sculptural. Um, I've really, as I move forward with these works, they're starting to sneak into my installation uh, work and ideas that we'll talk about later. Um, so there's just been so many possibilities within that. Um, so yeah, I definitely wanna keep my feet in both weaving and drawing. <laughs> um, so I straddle those two things. Um, whereas I think Gerhardt, um, you know, he's very much in fiber because his materials are all soft and he's using traditional, you know, fiber techniques under the fiber umbrella. Well, if, if anybody wants to know more about Gerhardt, we actually had an interview with him a couple of years ago. I think it was a, our first year he came on. So um, I encourage you, if you want to check out some of his work, you can. But um, I, I, I appreciate you sharing the, you know, compare and contrast between you and, and him. Um, Huge influence. I mean, he's a treasure to me. So. He was a delight to interview. I cannot imagine yeah. how much it much yeah. how nice it must have been to sit at the knee of the master. Exactly. And, uh, you know, learn from and many him. of us have who are in this field. He's very generous. But, he's very generous. Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing that was interesting is as I looked at over a lot of your work is that and like the one behind you and I'm one on the other side, is that you love the image of trees. And we have an image right here. It's called Swayze Beach Park. And it's the main focus of it is trees. And I, I think it's up on your wall too, right? Yeah, it's up behind me so you can yeah. see it installed, <laughs> so, how it operates in space. It's just, so tell us about trees. Why trees for you? What does it mean for you? Well, what turned me on to trees um, is that their um, relationship to human failure and almost family crisis. So that sounds sort of sad and depressing, but um, you know, as when I moved to Detroit area in 2001, um, there was a lot of ruins um, from the industrial age um, in the city. So as you drove around the city, um, you would see not only huge abandoned factories, car factories, but you would also see um, so many abandoned homes in the neighborhoods around these factories. Um, and the telltale sign, and this is what really turned me on to the trees, is that it was the tree that was taking over um, and making a ruin of these architectural structures. Um, and to me, that was almost a, a sublime, terrible moment, thinking about these trees <laughs> taking over, um, the, you know, taking over society, not society, but the architecture um, and civilizations that have been um, around. Um, and I actually was just in the Yucatan looking at lots of Mayan ruins. <laughs> Um, where the jungle has completely, um, you know, obliterated these huge, massive pyramids, um, and Mexico's doing a lot to sort of reclaim them and pull the jungle back and um, rehabilitate them. Um, so that was really sort of the moment where I really needed to start drawing trees um, because of that. I felt. They were incredible players in our existence as human beings. Um, and they have, you know, I sort of think of them as having a long history or a, a long game or a long view. Um, so that to me, their, their timeline is also um, something I'm very attracted to. And I sort of, I try to animate that. Um, Put, give them a place of power, um, which is not unusual. Um, but, you know, I sort of picture them just waiting for us to fail <laughs> um, so that they can take over again. <laughs> I will never look at trees the same 
after hearing <laughs> you say that. But tr it's true. You're right. If you go somewhere where nobody said anything to it, trees win. Exactly. And it's true all over. You know, I, I'm talking about Detroit and, and the neighborhoods, but, you know, it's true all around us. Um, I had the great privilege of living on Cranbrook campus, which is, you know, this utopia almost. Um, arts and crafts movement. But even on campus, you know, it's such a beautiful, expansive 320 acres, so many buildings, homes um, that could not be maintained. There was a lot of sort of abandonment right on this beautiful campus. Um, and again, around suburbia, you can tell when a home is abandoned by the neglect of the garden, right? Um, so it's it's all around us. So I, again, it's sort of like, I feel like the trees are are waiting for us to, to fail so they can take over again. <laughs> In the South, it's kudzu. Kudzu's kudzu. winning to take over the world. It will. <laughs> so you also, now this piece is behind you. So is four feet by three feet, kind exactly. of? Oh, okay. Yes. But and you that also do, go ahead. That one is a diptych. So it's it's two two foot pieces together. Okay. But um, you also do I'll, really I'll, large. Yes, I do very large. You can see the other one. Yeah, and I was going to say, you also do really large pieces. And the one we're going to look at now is called Three Loves. Um, and what's interesting about this installation is how you really wanted people to interact in it. It was not, because some pieces, you know, there's the signs up that say, don't touch, don't go beyond this point. But you did just the opposite. You wanted people in there uh, yes. being part of it almost. Would you talk some about that? Sure. Um, I'll go back. I have another um, degree in philosophy, actually. And um, while I was studying philosophy, I was greatly inspired by the philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer. Um, and he um, philosophizes a lot or bases his philosophy in the concept of play, playfulness, serious play, games. Um, and so I was very excited about that and felt in my own artistic work, which is sort of a visual working out of philosophy to me, um, that I wanted to incorporate playfulness. Um, and it just so happens when I started creating these large scale uh, installations, I also was the mother of two young sons. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I was observing my sons and how they threw themselves pell-mell into life. Learning was a full body experience. Um, and so I did not want to say no to them um, in regards to my artwork. I wanted to embrace their whole being in it. So it was sort of those two things happening um, all at once. Um, also very much interested in bringing in the sense of touch, which I think is, you know, part of the main, one of the main reasons a lot of us become fiber artists because of that tactility. Um, so I just enlarged it to this um, architectural scale. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I also will say it's interesting, I was making these installations before I started weaving. Um, so once I started weaving and seeing the verticality of the warp, I was a goner. <laughs> yeah. What, what is this made out of? Um, so all the um, installations that I make are made out of elastic. Um, this is a clear elastic. I also do colored elastic. Um, and the impetus for working with elastic was the fact that it um, responds to human movement, and then it recovers. So the installations can be just optical in and of themselves, beautiful to look at. Um, but once you start playing with them, they obviously change. But once you stop the movement, stop the interaction, they will 
recover and return to their to their formal self. Um, but what's incredible about these is the how much interaction they can withstand. So they look fragile, um, but you can actually just go up to them, pull them far apart, release it, snap it, um, and it will it will recover. So hmm. so great for children. <laughs> no matter their age. <laughs> yes. Well, we're going to look at another one. And this artwork is called Reach. And it was made, again, with the clear plastic. And I love it. And maybe this other one is the same thing. But it it's clear plastic that's used for bra straps. Yes. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, yeah, these clear elastic bra straps were the, the thing in the early 2000s when I was really researching the materials. So... Yeah. So how do you find your material? Where do you get it from? Um, well, a lot, a lot of the materials I, when I first started, I was working a lot with underwear elastic, so the woven. Um, and then, of course, I was always looking for elastic, and I came across this at Joanne's Fabrics, <laughs> this clear elastic. So it didn't take, you know, too much research to find this. It was, it's a common material but it just was getting it in the quantities that I needed to get it in that was the challenge well that's what I was wondering is I mean you're not going to buy like six inches of it so did you yeah. just go to the manufacturer and get it there or did Joanne's order it for you uh I went to the manufacturer I've also bought it off eBay a lot of money. oh okay yeah you can get it in large quantities there for cheap <laughs> cheaper well, we're going to go to the next image and the these, the one we just saw and the one that's coming up has one thing that I loved is the effects of shadow. And oh, I think I jumped ahead, uh, Mandy. Can you go back to that other one? There we go. I love the effects of shadow. Um, and it's so striking here. And I was thinking, did... Is that part of the planning when you're doing these? I mean, you talk about how many balls can you have in the air at once, you know, all these different aspects, visual, you have to keep, you know, keep track of and playing on. Was the shadow also part of it? Um, you know, when I'm designing them, I'm not thinking, oh, the shadow is going to go here, but you, you know, you know, there's going to be shadows. Um, so the play of light is, is really important in my work. And I would say it's also very important in the handwoven drawings, um, how the light hits the thread can really sort of articulate things um, that I can't predict, um, you know, and part of me doesn't want to predict these things as I'm, I'm making them because for me as a maker, I need to be surprised by you know, the, my own work. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm not surprised by it, um, I would get bored very quickly. So, you know, this image is a perfect image, a perfect example of, you know, once we lit it, like, oh my gosh, that's, that's amazing. I, you know, that's sort of beyond me. And I, you know, set up these conditions, um, and sort of unknowingly this happened. Um, and I am looking, I am actively looking for that in my work. Um, it's really important for me to be surprised. So yeah, there's only so much that I think you can, can predict and, you know, things happen too in the, in the making. Um, so yeah, I'm, I don't need to have my intentions, my intentions that I'm starting out with fulfilled for me to feel successful. I'd much rather be delighted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the next one we're going to look at is when I looked at some of your work, well, most of your work, I really got a sense of balance. Now I know on the big installations, you've got to deal with gravity. You know, you got to have that balance when you've got these big installations, but also there's the sense of balance visually. And these are beautiful examples, I think, of the balance that you have. And I'm not talking about 
symmetrical. It's not like the left side is like the right side, but they balance each other. Is that an important part of your work for you? Um, well, it's interesting that you use the word balance because that's not a word that I've really thought of. And now that you say it, it's very obvious. Um, you can also tell me, no, Kathy, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'm, you know, the words I'm thinking about are our tension, mm -hmm. especially with the, the installation. And then obviously the weavings are completely 100% dependent on tension of the threads. Um, and I have actually named installations tensions before. Um, but as far as the, the design strategies or the compositional strategies of the handwoven drawings, I'm very much looking at traditional textile design um, techniques. So, you know, mirroring, repeating, flipping. Um, so I, I do, I do want to keep these in that textile world. Um, so like the one on the left, um, which is called Vaughn, you know, you could say that almost looks like a rug. You know, one thing I love about rugs is they're designed to be entered from all different directions. Um, so, so that's something I am, I'm very much looking at. As far as, you know, combining the, the tree um, with this, I think it's important to note that the tr all the trees in my work are very specific trees. So you can take this image of a tree and you could say, this tree is located on this street. Mm. You could pinpoint it on a map. They are located somewhere on this planet. Um, and mostly, in the, obviously in the world that I'm, I'm inhabiting and walking around or driving around. So they're trees that stand out to me for one reason or another or their signifiers for me as well. Um, but then when I put them in repeat, um, they start to um, become something else, I think, as well. And so in that way, I, I hope that they're starting to be animated and um, take on sort of an otherworldly uh, characteristic. Um, and I don't think they're unlike Rorschach um, tests. Um, and I do like that psychological um, comparison to these images, um, but unlike a Rorschach test, inkblot test, that's a chance image. It's completely abstract. Um, there's no reference to the real world in, in it. However, my images are specific. They are located um, in the real world. Um, so I, that to me is incredibly important in these works. Well, we're going to move on to another image. I'm sorry, I'm still staring at those. The one thing I did <laughs> want to say, I almost forgot. I wanted to point out that the one on the left, it was at Vaughn? Yes, Vaughn. Okay, is behind you, right? Yep. Okay, because I want people, because when I saw it, the first thing I said was, oh my gosh, look how big it is. And that's always the problem when you look at photographs. You have no concept of the size. And I just want people to see how big these works are. Um, they're just beautiful. Um, and you can see it back there. Yeah, that's four feet by six feet. Wow. The first, the first image you showed is the biggest one to date. That was four feet by nine feet. Uh -huh. um, and I displayed it on an archway. Um, the armature is actually behind me. So you could wow. walk underneath it. Yeah, so okay. they're, they're starting to go into to architectural space, to installation, um, which is super exciting. Well, that's a great segue because we're going to talk about an architect. You are inspired by the Catalonian architect, Gaudí, who I'm a fan of. He, his images are on my computer. It's my computer um, paper, wallpaper. Um, and this is an example of some of his work. Um, so I know why other people, and I know why I love him. Why was he an influence for you? Um, well, he's one of the few people who I've actually cried when I've seen his, walked into his Sagrada Familia. I, 
I had the great ple pleasure of living in Barcelona in the 80s. Um, and when that church was just an open mud pit, like I remember seeing guys with wheelbarrows, you know, in the main sanctuary with the open sky. Um, so when I got to travel back to Barcelona a few years ago and to see it finished, it was incredibly moving. Um, but I mean, we could talk a long time about Gaudi, but um, I think one thing that I'm really looking at are his windows. Um, so here you can see them. They're super complicated. They're not just one thing. And I think that again, sort of ties in to what I'm aspiring to do, you know, by combining these different mediums. So here you have obviously the leaded colored glass. You have mosaics that surround it, but these mosaics are um, broken up plates. Um, so sort of everyday ceramics. Um, then you obviously have the, the architectural structure and the masonry and the texture of those bricks. Um, and then on this one, um, the Guel Crypt, you can see the wire mesh on top um, protecting the, the glass. Um, and interestingly, those are all recycled parts from a textile factory that was in this town where this crypt is. So huh. I, I really love, love how complicated these are, but still is a unified image. Um, so with the hand woven drawings, especially, um, you know, you have the drawing and this is hard to see in the, the photographs, but you have the threads superimposed on top of the drawing. And those threads all have patterns, mostly simple patterns like a rose path or herringbone on superimposed on top of them. So again, as you walk um, in front of the hand woven drawings, you will catch a glimpse of those patterns, which I think complicates it um, in a wonderful way. So yeah, it's good to have people who, you know, you are aspiring to, I think, and trying to emulate in your own way. Yeah, so Gaudi is definitely one of those. Plus, I mean, you could talk about nature and trees and, you know, the church, you know, cathedrals are sort of like human made forests in my mind, so. Well, you have retired, I understand, from being the artist and resident at the Kingswood Weaving Studio at Cranbrook. Um, so would you tell us some about this program, you know, how you got there and, and what your role was in there? Um, so yeah, I um, took over the Kingswood Weaving Studio in 2003, immediately after graduating from the Art Academy. Um, so suddenly I was in charge of the largest hand weaving studio in North America. It's incredible, beautiful space. Um, yeah, here's one section. There are 60 floor looms, six zero. Um, so, and it's in a high school at Cranbrook. Um, this is a Elial Saarinen designed weaving studio. So it was meant to be a weaving studio. So you can see the beautiful natural light and you can see all my Maycomber looms here. Um, and then uh, what of, another thing that's significant um, about the Kingswood Weaving Studio is this is where the Cranbrook loom was invented. Um, so Loya Saarinen, who was, took the charge of creating all the textiles um, for Cranbrook. Cranbrook is part of the arts and crafts movement. So everything was considered and everything was designed. Um, she, with um, her six Swedish weavers um, and one of the husbands of the weavers was a cabinet maker and she employed him to create uh, a loom for her weavers to weave her carpets and curtains and um, upholsteries. Um, and they liked them so well that um, they put them into production and that became the Cranbrook loom that we can, we all want one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow. and we have a whole wing I don't know if you have, I don't know if you have a picture there's a whole other wing in the studio that's all um the, the prototypes the Bexel looms the first looms and then there's another wing that's all the Cranbrook looms so it's an incredible facility um 
it's the most beautiful hand weaving studio on the planet, in my opinion. And um, it's all dedicated to very ambitious young teenage weavers. So, yeah, it was it was a joy to teach there, um, and I did it for twenty years. And now it's time to do this full time. <laughs> So I have a did lot you, of work to do. How do you think teaching in a, or being the artist in residence at Cranbrook impacted on your work? I mean, I could see how it would just be draining, but the other hand, I could see how it could be, you know, get those creative juices flowing. What was it like for you? Oh, it was all those things. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of work. I mean, I was teaching 60 people how to weave each semester so I had six classes plus extracurriculars which we're going to talk about in a minute um, so it was a very demanding job plus I lived on campus um, which required which was a beautiful place to live but it required me to work in the dorms or also um, but I had to keep making my work um, that was just not an option um, so it was, it was hard, and especially when my boys were young, you know, I didn't have a lot of time, but um, that actually is what returned me to drawing um, hmm. was, you know, because I was doing these large scale installations um, that, you know, there's a lot of logistics that go into to planning those and finding spaces to put them in. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but I didn't have that time or energy. Um, so I t returned to drawing at the early part of teaching um, because it, I always say the drawings would wait for me. <laughs> so if I had 10 minutes, you know, I could do laundry and, and just right. keep going. So I sort of say my career is built on 10 minute increments. <laughs> so. But now it can be full time, which is just a joy. <laughs> I like that. I think every woman in the world she could have a, you know, an embroidery on the wall that says my life is done in 10 minutes increments. My artwork is done. And that's excellent. It's excellent. <laughs> um, you are also co-founder of, and I'm probably butchering this, but let me give it a shot. Namtinga Sundo Babisi Studio, right? Oh, yeah, that was good. Yes. Okay. Um, Tell us about this, that. Um, so this is a weaving cooperative um, that was founded in 2007. I co-founded it with um, a woman named Noelle, who you can see here jumping um, in, on a cold April day in Michigan, poor thing. Um, but yeah, she, the, the Namtanka project actually started in 2000 with the uh, lower school here at Cranbrook. Um, they started, uh, there was a parent who served Peace Corps in this village of Namtanga um, in the 70s. And he stayed in touch with Noelle and her brother, Simeone. Um, and they were Cranbrook parents. Um, and so they, through fundraisers, um, the lower school started supporting the school in the village of Namtanga. So uh, Nantanga is in Burkina Faso. Um, it's a landlocked country just north of Ghana. It's on the edge of the Sahara. Um, so it is extremely hot here. Um, people and Nantanga is, there's not even a road to Nantanga. It's, it's very remote. Um, so, and people live subsistence level living here. Um, so we were able to come in and sort of support their efforts with education. And we were able to bring Noelle and Simeon to Cranbrook. Um, and I had just started teaching and I also have done development work, work in Honduras um, in a previous life. Um, so when I started teaching, I thought weaving would be an incredible way to bring together my interest in um, art and, you know, development work and so when Nove Noelle visited she came to the Kingswood weaving studio and it was like uh the skies opened up and she was like I must weave <laughs> um, and I must weave with the women of Nantanga 
Um, and so they approached me and asked me if I would help with this initiative. And I immediately said yes. That I was. It was just serendipity. Um, and so I um, got a club together of my students and we fundraised um, very quickly. Um, it was, everyone was so excited about this um, and they were weaving within a year and a half of Noelle being there and saying, I need to weave. Um, so this is actually um, the grand opening of the studio. So that was in 2007. Um, and I'm happy to report that they are still actively weaving today. Um, they are fully independent of Cranbrook. Um, so we're, we're merely a customer. So we will order fabrics from them now. Um, but yeah, they are, they're an enterprise. So 30 women are able to bring in income to their families through weaving. Oh, and I have some examples of their cloth. Oh, good. Um, I don't know if you can put me back up, but this is an example of, wow. like, they do the, a lot of ECOT and they love the shimmery. Um, and this is actually, they're weaving to create um, clothing. So a family will come and order uh, fabrics from a weaver and um, in the tradition there, they will have a party or, you know, it'll be an anniversary or a birthday and everyone at the party will be wearing this cloth. Um, so they'll take the cloth and get it custom designed um, and then all show up in this magnificent <laughs> cloth. Oh, these are beautiful. Garments. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, they're going gangbusters. Um, yeah. Such a proud thing, but um like I said, they're completely self-sufficient. And um, since I'm no longer at Cranbrook, um, I'm not sure what the future of the, the club. So I've worked with my students all these years. Um, so we're sort of waiting to see what the new instructor is going to do with, with Nantanga. So, but like I said, they are, they're fully independent. Now, were they doing backstrap looms or? No, the, the picture of the looms. Um, they have, you know, floor limbs. The difference is they don't have um, a warping beam, but they stretch it out. Oh, okay, okay. And it's weighted by by rocks. Okay, um, I saw the stretch. So I thought maybe it was, um, Mandy, you're so good. Thank you for putting that back yeah. up. Yeah, I can't yeah. see the picture well enough to see what was on the other end, but. Yeah, so those are rocks. Um, so they'll weave like, you know, 30 meters on, on one warp. It's, it's really, really impressive Wow! what, what they'll do. Um, and in the picture in the left-hand corner behind, you can see a woman um, with a tool that she's measuring out the warp and they will literally walk the warp across the, the courtyard there for meters and meters. Um, so it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, what they're doing in the conditions, oh, wow. like it's 120 degrees there. So it's, it's hot and dusty. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That's a great story. And what a great experience for the kids. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. One of the highlights of my, my career at Cranbrook is this Namtanga Sundo Babisi. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. So you, you've done so much. What's next for you other than weaving? A lot of weaving. What else is down the pike yeah. for you? Um, well, when I get off of here, I'm going to cut those that weaving off the loom. I'm so <laughs> excited. I've sort of been waiting so you guys could see my loom full. Um, but that work will go into a solo exhibition I have opening next month. Um, I have a commission on the docket, and um, I'll have a museum show in early 2025. But really... What I care about most is just making my work and not in 10 minute increments now <laughs> in <laughs> eight hours a day. <laughs> so I'm really excited about where things are heading. Where's the exhibit? Uh, at Muskegon Museum of Art here in Michigan. Okay. And it opens next month? 
Oh, that exhibition is, um, the one that opens next month is in Detroit here at a gallery in Detroit called Materia Gallery. Okay. Yeah. People are gonna wanna go see it. So I'll make sure they know. Um, so let's, we've got tons of questions. Sorry, I'm distracted here. We've got questions popping up left and right. Um, so let's try to get some of these folks. We're not going to get to all your questions today. I'm so sorry. But <laughs> we're going to get to them as many as we can. A lot of them are how to's and I don't know that we can really answer them today, but let's get started. Um, somebody wanted to know if do you vary the weave structure um, or, and I'm assuming what they're asking is, or do you only do plain weave? No, I do. I do other patterns as well, mostly okay. like rose path. I have to be really careful with the patterns I choose because of the structure, you know, cause the, the strips are, they're anywhere from a quarter of an inch to a half an inch. So if the strings start to jump over more than, you know, two, three at the most, um, you know, I have to be really careful that it will stay structurally sound. Oh, good point. So, uh -huh. so the, the patterns are, are pretty simple, straightforward ones. Yeah. <laughs> at this point, at this point, we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, I should have asked this while the image was up. Cause I asked, I thought that too, the piece that's over your right shoulder, are there helicopters in that picture? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a uh, Swansea beach park. Um, this is Swansea. a monkey. It's a monkey pod tree in Hawaii. Um, and my sort of, this piece is a tribute to my son who is in the army um, and stationed in Hawaii. Um, so we got to visit him. Um, so he has a, um, a what I, I'm gonna botch this, um, not paratrooping, but, oh, he has an airborne uh, a tab um, in the army. So he learned how to, jump out of those helicopters. <laughs> uh, so that's why the helicopters are there. And on the island of o Oahu, where they are, there's a lot of military presence. Um, so you can be at the beach enjoying your day and all of a sudden these Chinooks will, will fly across the water. Um, so, um, but this, the, it's so funny because the mirroring of this tree, um, which I actually think is very feminine. I. I feel like this is the mother. <laughs> um, it also resembles a parachute. So if you look at that airborne tab, it, this image almost looks exactly like the tab that he wears. So that's a little insight into, into that piece. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, Elizabeth but, oh, but the, helicop the helicopters are, uh, just are uh, attached by magnets through the, through the handwoven drawing. It's attached yeah. by what? Magnets. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So they're yeah. just little tiny cutouts <laughs> collaged. Oh, that's clever. Well, Elizabeth Faust said, those look like Chinooks. <laughs> they are Chinooks. She knew what it was, what it was. Way to go, Elizabeth. Um, oh, what is the warp that you use for the, do you vary um, it or do you have a constant? like cotton or linen or? Yeah, tr I mean, mostly it's pearl cotton. Um, okay. Fine, pearl cotton. Although this warp, I'm starting to expand. Um, the warp that Ooh. I'm using right now is this gorgeous <laughs> iridescent Ooh. thread um, that I found from Japan. Um, so, and I was a little nervous, but it worked. So, you know, I, I'm always playing. I'll use metallic threads as well. Um, but yeah, I, I'm always looking for, for new possibilities. So th with this piece, when I take it off, the surprise is gonna be, how does that thread operating? And I'm so excited <laughs> to see, and how will that play with the light? Um, Cause normally the cotton just is sort of camouflages and it's just sort of a subtle presence. So, so the warp is something I'm really excited about exploring and maybe starting to paint it, doing some ecot as well. So those are, things in my mind to do in the future. Yeah. <laughs> um, how thick is the wood? Um, it's very thin. It's like one uh, 32nd 
Oh, okay. Wow. Wow. This then. Ooh. Um. No, oh, somebody, this is Sherry, and she's saying that she's working on images on glass, and she's trying to figure out how to, to weave those. Um, she said she's Good doing luck. a wire. <laughs> and then she said, then she wanted to know what kind of warp do you use, and are you worried about the strips breaking or braiding the warp? That's what I was curious about. Is that ever an issue with the wood? I haven't had an issue with that. Okay. No. Um, I would be with glass, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, somebody asked about the rocks for the weaving. Carrie, I hope you got that answer. Um, oh, somebody wants to know, is there a website? Terry Shoemaker wants to know, is there a website for the studio in uh, Africa? Um, unfortunately, it just came down because I'm no longer at Cranbrook. Um, oh, okay. So, yeah, you missed it. Sorry. <laughs> but there are images of it on my uh, personal website, marcelinbennettcarpenter.com. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, somebody wants to know, what was the name of the philosopher that you referenced to about serious play, playfulness? Uh, his name is Hans Georg Gadamer, G-A-D-A-M-E-R. Okay. All right. Uh, Karen LeBlanc wants to know, can you talk about how you decide to install your larger pieces, whether they are woven on your loom or suspended? Um, I, I just can't imagine all the details and factors you have to take in about mounting things. Um, well, I don't know if you can, I can sort of, you can sort of see they're mounted on on brackets, just really simple brackets, and then a bar, and then they're suspended out mm -hmm. from the wall. And then I paint the backs of them. Um, so like Swansea Beach Park is painted a super bright fluorescent pink. So when it's lit correctly, it will actually glow from behind. Really? Yeah. Oh, there you go. There's a pink cast to that one. Some have a green, you know, whatever color. Um, so, but it's a pretty simple mounting. Somebody wants to know, can they, can we see what's on your loom? I don't know that we can do that. Can we? Uh, let's see. It's sort of dark in here. Let's see if I can. Wait, go Lou. <laughs> Good question. That's underneath it. Oh, wow. <laughs> And, and it comes to off today, huh? Yep, it's going to come off. Ah. Wow. So, yeah, I'd have to do a large header on, on them so, to get the bars in there. Hey, I'm checking here. Sorry, I'm taking too much time. Um, people want to know where do you get the wood? Um. It's called, <laughs> uh, I think it's called balsa. What is it called? Oh, it's balsa wood? Like you make airplanes out of? And there's a company, yeah. There's oh, okay. a company that has balsa in its name. Is it American balsa? Um, but I'm sure if you Google it, you can. Okay. You can also get it on Blick. Um, you can get it at Joanne Fabrics as well. <laughs> so it's common, it's, it's readily available. Yay, Dick Blick. What do we do without Dick Blick? <laughs> well, Lynn, thank you so much for being with us today oh. and sharing your, your inspirations and your creativity and most importantly, your work. It's beautiful. And I love your studio. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it looks thank like you, you got a great workspace there <laughs> that you're going to spend a great deal of time in in the near future, right? Well, I'm excited about your exhibits. I hope people are, if they're in the area, they'll go take a look um, at it in Detroit and uh, see the exhibit of your work. Thank you so much for being on here today. Um, if you want to see more, go to her website, marcelinbennettcarpenter.com, uh, and you can see more about her and her work. And do you have the exhibits listed on there? Uh, not yet. I'm also on Instagram um, at Lynn Bennett Carpenter. Um, so I'll be posting there as well. So you can follow Great. me. And 
Facebook too. Great. We want to thank our sponsor today. Uh, we love it when our sponsors come on and, and do these wonderful shows for us. It's Ply Spinners Guild. If you want more information about them, please go to their website. Um, we thank them for sponsoring Lynn today. Um, we loved having Lynn on here. And thank you so much for doing that. If you would like to sponsor an episode of Textiles and Tea, you can go to the website and you can um, purchase a date right there and then. If you have a questions, give us a call and uh, we can work with you on a good time for you to be a sponsor. It could be you, it could be your business, it can be your guild, whatever you wanna do. You wanna sponsor an event? We've had people do that to celebrate an opening of an exhibit or a conference. So give us a call. We'd love to have you as our sponsor. Um, we also want to talk about the guild retreat. Um, those of you who went before have talked about how much your guild has learned. So I encourage you all, if you're in a guild, you want to start a guild, you're an um, officer of the guild, or you're thinking about being an officer of the guild, check out the uh, guild retreat, guild development retreat for 2024, not 23. Uh, we're going to be talking about a variety of topics. It's a one day online uh, event and it's a panels and it's January the 27th. And we're going to have panels that you can attend and talk to. But the unique thing about it is that it's a lot of sharing. We have the speakers who are going to share what they know. You're going to share with each other. Um, you know how that is. You learn more from the people around you and their experiences and what worked for them and what didn't for them. You'll find people in guilds around the same size as your guild or maybe larger or smaller, whatever you're, you know, might be striving to become a bigger guild. Um, and we're doing this so that the guilds can can get motivated and learn how to build and grow their guilds. And it's just been so successful and we're excited to do it again. Now there's gonna be four panels and one is hosting a guild sale. I know a lot of guilds are interested in doing that. Diversity and inclusion, developing your board, always an issue, and keeping up and staying relevant in a technological world. So those will be the four topics. We've got some great panelists that are gonna be on there and share what they know and their experiences. Now to, to attend, if you are an affiliate guild, you are allowed four people from your guild to attend for free. That's up to the guild to decide who those will be. If you wanna go on your own or if your guild wants to send more, it's $20 if you're a member and $50 if you're not a member. Um, and I encourage you, if you're not a guild member yet, if you're not a member of HGA and you want to send four people, do the math. It's cheaper to, to join and get those four free people. So here's a good reason why you, um, some of you guilds might want to join HGA. You can register online or you can give us a call. You can go weavespindie.org or give us a call and we'll be glad to help you with that. So thank you um, for everybody who's worked on that. It's a big project. We appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you January the 27th. There's more information online at wevespendie.org. We want to thank all the support that we get to make this program possible, whether you are joining or donating or both. And thank you to everyone from donating at the end of the year last month. It really is. We appreciate that. And these donations are what makes these programs happen, whether it's the Guild Retreat, Textiles and Tea, Careers and Textiles, all these events, and we want to continue them, and we're looking to expand and find out what is it our membership wants from us and needs from us. So thank you so much. <laughs> Excuse me. If you've missed an episode, you can go back and watch it again. We are so excited. Next week, we have Chiavana Imperia, and we are excited to have her there. Thank you all so much, and happy tea. <laughs>